Faith in the Fog is based on an excellent sermon series presented by Pastor Lance Lowell of Neighborhood Church in Modesto, California. Pastor Lowell gave me his sermon notes and encouraged me to design a video series. The episodes that you will see are a collaboration between Pastor Lowell and myself. I hope you enjoy this production. Let's see. Today is Sunday. What do I need to do? Okay, the lawns need to be mowed and the shrubs need to be trimmed. Both of my kids have practice. My wife will take Jenny to cheerleading practice and I'll take Johnny to football practice. Then we'll regroup for lunch and go to my parents for a visit. Wait. Today is Sunday. We have church. I just don't see how I can fit church into our schedule. Wait, I can make up for missing church by going to Bible study on Wednesday. No, I can't do that because I need to work overtime and the kids have practice. I know. I can go to our home group on Friday. Wait, I can't do that either because of the kids' games. I just don't know what to do. I don't have time for everything. My schedule is too demanding. I'm so confused. Be careful. A spiritual fog is forming and the source of this fog is the confusion and chaos created by an out-of-control schedule. Confusion can allow a gray nothingness to shroud our relationship with God. Confusion comes about when we are not able to find the answer to life we need, when we are not able to know the direction required, or even know what is expected of us. We are in a fog of confusion. Webster's Dictionary defines confusion as a situation in which people are uncertain about what to do or are unable to understand something clearly. The feeling that you have when you do not understand what is happening or what is expected. A state or situation in which many things are happening in a way that is not controlled or orderly. How do we find faith in the fog of confusion? In order to answer this question, we first must define the problem. The biggest contributor to the confusion we experience is the busyness of life. The busier we are, the more we are unable to discover our true priorities. The more we yield to the chaos of our schedule, the harder it is to see clearly our true spiritual direction the more we are sucked into the quagmire of schedule confusion, the more unsure we are about what deserves the investment of ourselves. Jesus warned his followers that the main highway of life is a road that leads to destruction. Let's read. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate 
and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. We think that because we are Christians, this verse does not apply to us. We believe the destruction referenced in this verse is utter and complete damnation to hell. But this is not the case. The Greek word used in this verse for destruction is apolia, that means to suffer ruin or loss. Damnation is the extreme application of this word. Maybe the ruin or loss we see in our lives is the result of aimlessly driving on the broad road of destruction. Our confusion could be nothing more than the first fruits of destruction manifesting in our Christian walk. Do our schedules reflect the narrow road that leads to life? Have we allowed Jesus to be our shepherd? How we answer these questions will determine to what degree we are on a collision course with destruction. Let's read out of the book of Psalms. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Consider this thought. We are either grazing in these pastures or we are straying from the shepherd. Let's consider three simple facts we can glean from the chaos of a busy schedule. Busyness steals special moments. Special moments require us to be present, and we are not present when we are too busy, mentally or physically. Busyness kills listening. Ultimately, this means relationship. In order to listen, we must stop and focus, but we rarely listen anymore. Busyness destroys peace. Peace is the presence of God, not the absence of conflict. When we are busy, the first thing that often goes is our relationship with Jesus Christ. All three of these facts are the symptoms of the ruin and loss found on the broad road of destruction. The first thing we need to do in order to cut through the fog of confusion is to identify our biggest need and take care of it. To illustrate this point, let's return to the New Testament and consider the examples presented to us by Mary and Martha of Bethany. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, 
and it will not be taken away from her. In this narrative, we see two different approaches to serving Jesus. We see Martha welcome Jesus into her home, but then neglect him as she prepared the evening meal, while Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. Martha was overwhelmed with the chores of the meal to the point that she needed help. But Mary just sat at the feet of Jesus, shirking her duties in meal preparation, but she did not neglect Jesus. Jesus realized that Martha was worried and upset about many things, but Mary chose to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn from Him. Martha chose to serve Jesus, while Mary chose to worship Jesus. This incident displays the importance of pursuing the right priorities. Martha chose to set her focus on meal preparation, while Mary chose to set her focus on Jesus. Let's not be too hard on Martha, because what she was doing was a good deed. I'm not sure that before the night was over, a dinner was expected, but was preparation needed at that moment? Mary chose what was needed, while Martha chose what was good. Good actions are not always needed actions. Martha slipped into a fog of confusion because she failed to set her priority on relationship with Jesus. Martha experienced a couple of consequences because of the choices she made. Martha began to believe that Jesus did not care about her. She allowed her work to distract her to the point that she was worried and upset about many things. This incident with Mary was only the tip of the iceberg. She was frustrated and upset with Mary long before this meal occurred. Martha is convinced that others, especially Mary, needed to adjust their behavior, not her. This incident between Mary and Martha can be a life lesson. What do we really need? How we answer this question will determine how successful we are to the fog of confusion. Is our life filled with distractions that cloud our ability to determine what we really need? What we need is a relationship with Jesus Christ. All our activities might have good motives, but do we really need to be involved in so many things? Jesus said that only one thing is needed. He did not say that only one thing is good or positive. Our biggest need as disciples of Christ is to abide in His presence and receive His instruction. When we become critical or filled with self-pity, we might be walking in the fog of confusion. When we become harsh with others and constantly worry, we might be walking in the fog of confusion. When we begin to wonder about Christ's love and care for us, we might be in the fog of confusion. We better reevaluate our priorities because we could end up like Martha, busy but not blessed.
The second thing we need to do to cut through the fog of confusion is to prevent the expectations of others from hindering our spiritual health. One of the most difficult things we manage in life is the expectations of others. Consider this thought. Can we be manipulated by peer pressure? The answer is yes. There are very few people who can operate their lives free from the pressure of what others expect. Peer pressure, even Christian peer pressure, can be the source of confusion and fear that frustrates our walk with Christ. Consider this example from the Gospel of John. Yet, at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. But, because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved praise from men more than praise from God. Jesus had secret followers among the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of Israel. But they would not openly acknowledge their faith in him out of fear of the Pharisees. They would not risk their position in the synagogue for the sake of Jesus Christ. In their thinking, they had too much to lose with the prospect of little gain. Why did these respected leaders keep their faith quiet? The answer is simple, peer pressure, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus was not immune from peer pressure. As his ministry grew, the demands of the people also grew. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you! The crowds followed Jesus wherever he went. He had very little time to himself. Jesus understood that the strength and soul of his ministry was relationship with his Father. He found time to be alone with God by seeking a solitary place of prayer in the early hours of the morning. Jesus would not let peer pressure rob him of his relationship with God. In the book of Isaiah, we find a prophetic word about the Messiah relating to who he would be and what he would do. Let's read. The Sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. God would give the Messiah the knowledge and ability to teach the weak and weary. But the Messiah would also understand that he must open his ears to the personal instruction given to him by God in the early hours of the morning. Even Isaiah understood 
that the heart of the Messianic ministry would be quiet time spent with God. When we allow peer pressure and the expectation of others to direct our Christian walk, we allow the fog of confusion to settle around us. When we allow the voices of multiple people to influence our faith, we are putting our relationship with Christ at risk. What do we do when these voices do not agree with one another? We enter a storm of conflict and confusion. It is so important we understand that our walk with Jesus is our personal walk with Him. Our personal relationship with Jesus should not be subject to the peer pressure of family, friends, or even co-workers. We stand or fall before Christ by what He thinks of us, not by what our peer group thinks. In order to silence the confusing voices that surround us, we must find a solitary place to pray and hear the voice of God. Only a quiet relationship with Jesus will cause the fog of confusion to lift. The third thing we need to do to cut through the fog of confusion is to connect our life to a guide who knows the way. Let's return to our fog analogy. When driving in the fog, one of the greatest helps is a vehicle, especially a truck, in front of us with their lights on. The fog may be thick and confusing, but a fellow traveler can help guide the way because it is dangerous to cut through the fog without being able to see any familiar compass points. While we are in the fog of confusion, we should be more open to look for guides to lead the way. Who or what are these guides? When we are walking through the gray nothingness of confusion, trust our Savior. Trust that He will keep us safe and secure in His love. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Notice what Jesus says in this invitation. Learn from me. Jesus already knows that we are struggling to find our way in the fog. He understands that we're confused and lack purpose. Jesus wants us to attach ourselves to Him, to receive His yoke, and to willfully receive His guidance, assurance, and care. Our relationship with Jesus Christ is our primary guide out of the fog of confusion. Again, trust our Savior, and this is done through prayer and the Holy Scriptures. I can hear the responses now. All preachers say the same thing. It's prayer and the Bible. This seems so cliché. These two actions may seem rudimentary, but they are absolutely essential.
The Bible teaches that the Word of God is a guide for us to follow. It is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. The Bible also teaches that great peace is found by those who love God's Word, and nothing can make them stumble. Powerful Promises for Those Caught in the Fog of Confusion How important is solitary devotional prayer to our walk with Christ? It is the central focal point to our relationship with God. Jesus needed solitary prayer in order to silence the voices of the crowds that followed him. The solitary place of prayer became the green pastures and the quiet waters that restored Jesus' soul. Jesus understands the chilling fog of fear and confusion. He experienced it in the Garden of Gethsemane just prior to his crucifixion. Fear overwhelmed Jesus to the point that he asked God to free him from this horrid end. Jesus needed his soul restored. Therefore, he sought the green pastures and still waters of solitary prayer. I'm convinced that without the solitary prayer of Gethsemane, Jesus would not have been prepared for Calvary. Just remember this example. Should the fog of fear and confusion envelop you, take the time to find your solitary place. Remember, confusion comes when we are not able to find the answer to life we need. Just remember, we are not the only people to be surrounded by the fog of confusion. Others have also wrestled with the deafening voices of confusion. Now is the time to stay connected with the body of Christ and seek wise counsel from more mature Christians who have walked the path before us. The book of Proverbs teaches that a wise person listens to advice and accepts instruction. When we find ourselves in a spiritual fog, stop and seek guidance from those who have gone before us. It is so easy to allow fear and panic to distort our view of God and His church. People do foolish things when they slip into a fog. They leave churches, they quit jobs, they break relationships, and most of these actions they eventually regret. Should we see a spiritual fog settling around us, don't make any major decisions and stay connected with the body of Christ. Now is the time to maintain self-discipline because the fog of confusion can be very destructive. Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years 
is as nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. Man is a mere phantom as he goes to and fro. He bustles about, but only in vain. He heaps up wealth, not knowing who will get it. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. King David was a man who found himself in a chilling fog of confusion. He suffered with emotional and physical wounds, and nobody seemed to care. While in this miasma of fear and self-doubt, David cried out to the Lord for help during this season of confusion. Show me, O Lord, where have I gone wrong? Show me the error of my ways. Finally, God answered and gave David clarity. He saw his missteps and his sin. He realized that he spent his life bustling about, heaping up wealth and success. He realized that all his pursuits were in vain. In the end, David understood that all his hope is found in the Lord. Maybe the time has come for you to be introspective in your spiritual fog. Maybe the prayer of David should become your prayer. Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. Now is the time to find your hope in the Lord.